and welcome everyone to another episode of We Are Being Transformed. Contrary to popular opinion, this is not a Transformers podcast, so I am sorry to inform you there will be no um, Rodimus Prime unboxings here. Um, however, we do talk here about the intersection and uh, exchange of ideas of people with their culture, their myth, and their lore. And um, joining us today is a figure who needs no introduction, but in case you're not familiar, Garrett Ryan has a YouTube channel called Told in Stone, and this is one of the best examples of forward-facing scholarship I can think of. Um, he releases weekly videos um, discussing a myriad of topics from the daily life of Greeks and Romans in antiquity. So Garrett, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. The honor's all mine. So Garrett, um, I thought I'd start with just a little bit of uh, my own estimation of how sometimes we tend to, when we study history, uh, we get preoccupied with the macro aspects. Like Julius Caesar was assassinated on this day. The Roman Empire fell on this day in 476, et cetera. Um, we get preoccupied with these things and sometimes neglect the everyday aspect of the people on the ground, uh, what they're doing. Um, you know, as they go through their daily lives, you know, um, and this is what I really love about your book, um, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Um, in it, you have tons of sketches and anecdotes about the day-to-day -day life of uh, the people of antiquity. So I didn't know if you had any further thoughts on this and wanted to elaborate on why you approached the book this way. Well, sure. I mean, as a as scholars, so I, I was trained as a historian, an ancient historian, before I left and went off into the weird, weird and wild world of YouTube. Um, and uh, we're going to do the same thing. You know, we always tend to focus on, you know, these famous events, famous people, um, you know, big history, which is a great thing in many ways. It answers questions we couldn't answer otherwise. And it gets students in the doors, frankly, for our survey classes. But, um, you know, all too often we leave aside um, in those grand narratives, um, these granular details, um, which make it all come to life. You know, these are people ultimately, you know, Julius Caesar had a life too. It wasn't just this, you know, marble monument of a figure, you know, who went off, conquered Gaul and got stabbed. You know, he also had, you know, he lived in Rome, you know, he slipped on those muddy streets. Um, you know, he visited the baths, um, you know, he went through the spice markets. And so at Told in Stone, my, my goal was to try to capture some of that uh, granularity, you know, these details that make antiquity more than just a register of great names and famous dates. And in my book, um, I tried to do the same thing. It was just um, answers uh, 36 questions I was asked um, by students mostly in my various courses um, about everything, you know, from, you know, did they wear underwear? You know, these are just kind of seemingly strange questions that get you at, you know, everything from, you know, what clothing did and what it was meant to present in antiquity um, to kind of these grander things. Like, do they believe their myths? Which again, gets us into these, you know, very far reaching questions about um, ancient religion and religious practice, but not really asked typically um, in, you know, survey courses. Uh, so that's my hope, both what I do on YouTube and what I do as an author is to try to make, um, you know, the, the vividness, um, the reality of antiquity a little more real. Well said. Thank you for that answer. Um, so, like I was saying in the um, in the book, you have these amazing, like sometimes very insane uh, anecdotes in the footnotes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorites is about um, Alexander the Great's body. Um, yes. You talk about Augustus. Uh, he's going to pay reverence, right? And it's almost like a mm -hmm. scene out of like a Judd Apatow movie. Like he's going in there and he's going to like plant this kiss and pay reverence and uh, mm -hmm. obeisance to the the body and uh so he gives this kiss to alexander and on the cheek and it, the, the nose just breaks off <laughs> it's like that's one of my like favorites it's very a very surreal scene like a monty mm -hmm. python sketch um so i didn't know if you could talk about maybe one or two of your favorite anecdotes you have in the book sure yeah i mean alexander's body is a great one um you wonder how he played it off he tried like stick it back on you know to kind of just like dare anybody behind him to say anything you know <laughs> like a bit of glue. Um, 
but right, you know, the body of Alexander is this wonderful um, example of a, a very famous artifact, essentially, you know, the, this mummified corpse of the great conqueror um, that is revered um, as by Augustus, you know, throughout the classical world, but experiences some thoroughly ridiculous uh, side quests um, along its journey to oblivion at the hands of an earthquake or tsunami in late antiquity. Um, you know, even before Augustus had his little, um, you know, incident with the nose, um, the body was hijacked at one point. It was on its way to Macedon uh, when Ptolemy shows up with a whole troop of horsemen, says, no, you're going to Egypt now. So they, they turn the mules around and off it goes. It's put in storage for a while, uh, for like, like 15 years, where they're trying to build this giant tomb. Then, you know, the, one of the later emperors decide, one of the later Ptolemies decides that the coffin is worth so much, he just has to have it. So they pop the body out of the coffin, like, you know, pop it against the wall, I assume, melt the coffin down, put a new coffin in. Um, so it really it did. Uh, Ikarakala supposedly tried to pretty much caress the thing. Um, you know, he, he, he took off all of his jewelry and threw it into the, you know, the casket you know, as another thing of reference, uh, reverence. And it's a wonderful uh, that, that set of stories. Um, but you know, what my favorite part about writing naked statues, um, so each question, the each answer rather, is meant to be pretty self-contained. It's, you know, uh, usually two to three pages or you know, rather two to five pages, you know, a couple thousand words. And it has to be pretty coherent and pretty fast moving. But I would stumble upon all of these wonderful asides, um, things like Alexander's body and its, you know, misadventures. And to incorporate those into what I was saying in naked statues, I, I would put these footnotes on the page. And usually footnotes, you know, people are soured on footnotes by them usually being, you know, lists of authorities. Um, I banished all that to the end notes, you know, to spare the reader, you know, my, my list of, uh, you know, primary sources and uh, just try to populate the footnotes with these anecdotes, um, which, you know, make it all again, come to life. So just even in the first, um, the first chapter um, of Naked Statues, um, which is about uh, did the recent Romans wear pants, trousers, um, and I talk about how that came about, uh, basically through soldiers who were on the station on the northern frontier, feeling awfully frostbitten in their tunics and meaning to wear first kind of these uh, knee breeches and later on actual full-blown pants. Um, we have things from, um, oh boy, like a few emperors, you know, shocked the world by wearing pants kind of prematurely. It was a fashion statement that no one was ready for. Um, Nero at one point presided over a, a sting for purple dye in the one of the forums of Rome. So you want to see that Mr. Nome was wearing his shade of purple, the imperial purple. Um, another footnotes about how pants were outlawed in Rome twice, actually three times. Uh, they had to keep banning pants from Rome because they were so unseemly, so barbaric. Um, and, and again, another aside about how, because there are no pockets in antiquity, at least you know, you'd, you'd wear like a money purse or something, you'd hang it from your belt or from your neck. Um, how often in Greece, but people would carry coins in their mouth, which well, led other mishaps, as you might imagine. So things like that, you know, these little uh, nuggets of information that I would stumble upon when I was reading that I think makes the, the text, uh, the experience of the text so much richer. I really hate the fact that in the audiobook people don't have access to that. So I always encourage people to read the book, you know, as, you know in print if they can, just to get the footnotes. Right. I have, I have it on Kindle. I have it on my Kindle and I just kind of, oh, yeah. I always love to go through, through those anecdotes. Oh yeah. yeah. So you can read them on Kindle though, right? You can like click on the, the note. And yeah. You out. just click on the note. Oh, it, hyper, it hyperlinks everything. Oh, fantastic. So. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, yeah, they were really weird about that purple dye, weren't they? Like, yeah, yeah. They made laws <laughs> later on about it. Like mm -hmm. nobody could manufacture it. It became almost like a, mm -hmm. a, a cartel a racket for the, very much so. Yeah. For yeah, the yeah. empire. Um, and again, you were talking about the body of Alexander. That that went through a lot of very interesting weekend at Bernie's situations. It, very much so, yes. <laughs> I think mean, about the sunglasses, pretty much. Yeah, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a, it was like a totem. It was like a, mm -hmm. like almost like you would think about like uh, the body of a saint or a mm -hmm. martyr before the right. concept. I mean, the concept existed in hero cults, but yeah, mm -hmm. his body was very much like a totem for a lot of these. Uh, emperors and groups um yeah. well just just to break in there very quickly um you know so people would wear medallions with his face on them to ward off illnesses the idea that it, that this great conqueror had a kind of apotropaic function that you know he had been such a success, successful person that by extension you know something of that would imbue an image of him and that wearing it gave you this this invulnerability and, and one theory about what happened to his body actually is that it was literally pulled apart by relic seekers 
that you know in antiquity you know when it was you know the the tomb was being ruined by earthquakes to tsunamis civil war um at some point the casket was cracked open and if it wasn't spirited away which is you know the folks have very several madcap theories um it was quite likely pulled apart people took little bits of alexander as a talisman very much like a saint's body would be you know a century later where it became something you have in the church um it's imbued some way some extension of that person's holiness for a saint or greatness for Alexander could become yours if you had in your possession, I don't know, a bit of his fingertip or something. Yeah, very, very Greek magical papyri there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. The same era, of course, that those are being written as when this is happening, we think. So. Absolutely. Um, and, and just one more thing before I get on to my next question, but mm-hmm. you mentioned it briefly, um, but pants. People, we don't think we, we don't think about this, but pants were considered effeminate and barbaric for a mm-hmm. lot of the time back then. Like, you know, we don't wear pants like those those Persians mm-hmm. wear the pants. Right. Look at things like the Sabbath the, the Sabastan, um, mm-hmm. all these um depictions of uh imperial victories and mm-hmm. all the all the barbarians, quote unquote, who are subjugated, all the males are wearing the pants, like mm-hmm. quote unquote sissies. So yeah, it's a very, very strange kind of thought world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that, that, you know, for us, it's been so internalized that pants are, you know, if anything, a masculine article of clothing, or at least were until a generation ago. Um, and, and right, yeah, for the for the Romans, that it, it was it was othered, you know, it was something that we don't do, but those people north or east to do it, and so that that you know made the whole thing taboo. Yeah, just hilarious stuff it's like just as a history major that was always one of the things that really grabbed me like Mm -hmm. when i was studying this stuff what i wanted to talk about briefly was something that you touch on your channel a lot uh, which is numismatics Mm -hmm. Um, so you talk a lot about coins um and maybe people who are more focused maybe like people like me nowadays who are interested lay people who focus more on the text we don't mm-hmm. understand the full importance of numismatic numismatic evidence for the historian of antiquity. So I didn't know if you could briefly touch upon the importance of numismatics. Sure. Um, you, you know, and, and that's true among historians too. You know, all too often we are, you know, texts become almost a sort of cult because of course they are the most important aspect of our evidence for antiquity. It's only through them we access the thought world of antiquity. Um, but, you know, all too often our training as a gender historian, like when I was going through my doctoral program, um, everything I did was texts. Um, even though, you know, my dissertation ended up being very heavily archaeological in various respects, you know, I received no training on how to, how to deal with that evidence. And even people who do, do archaeologists archaeologists tend to leave numismatics aside in its own weird little sub-discipline where, you know, these people, you know, study the, the coins as artifacts and as products of antiquity. But it's almost banished the field of art history or something that's just not quite classical enough. And that's ridiculous because, you know, in, for many aspects of ancient history, coins are the most important category of evidence we have. So I can give you a few examples. Um, so uh, Bactria, uh, the, the famous Greek kingdom in Central Asia, and what, based on what's now Afghanistan and the, the other stands north of it, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. Um, so that we have only a few texts that record what happened in Bactria, because it was so far removed from the Mediterranean. Um, we have, you know, these snippets of, you know, lists of king names, you know, X or Y, you know, defeated the Sarmatians in a battle. And that's it. But we have these a glorious series of coins, silver coins, admitted by the Bactrian kings, which tell us both who those kings were um, and a great deal about how they wanted to project themselves. Um, you know, so they wanted to be warriors. We have them, you know, on horseback spearing, you know, these uh, nomadic horsemen. We have them, um, you know, as as Hellenes. Um, all the legends are, of course, in Greek, despite the fact that their subjects were mostly um, Persian speakers. Um, and then later on, when they expanded into India, we have these fascinating examples of cultural fusion, where one side of the coin might be in Greek, the other side will be um, in Sanskrit, um, or in some uh, language derived from Sanskrit, or it might have a Buddhist image on it. Um, and so for Greeks in the East, coins are absolutely crucial for understanding um, how these kingdoms functioned, um, what their cultural policies were, um, who they wanted to be, essentially. Um, in the Mediterranean world, where we know more from texts, um, we still know quite a bit from coins. Um, things like the great inflation crisis of the third century in the Roman Empire. We can track the declining silver content of the denarius and the Antoninianus, and that tells us exactly how bad the crisis was, how much silver is in the coins. 
Um, look at their legends, uh, you know, the, what they're putting on the coins. And again, that's the most important propaganda the emperors had was their coinage. You know, nine tenths of the population is illiterate. Uh, they're not reading Virgil, they're not reading Horace, but they're using coins. Um, and the images on those coins tell you again what the emperor wants to project. The legends themselves are important too, but even as having the goddess or that abstraction or the emperor being crowned by victory um, is our most important window in many ways into imperial iconography. Um, you know, there was that whole furor or, you know, internet tizzy uh, around Sponsonian, you know, the, the, this new, or Sponsian, sorry, the, the, this new emperor um, discovered, you know, um, from a coin uh, that had been known for a long time, but had been judged fake before. And we know actually about a half dozen emperors only from coins. They're not recorded in any text. They were short-lived, you know, they were usurpers, they were, you know, uh, kind of has-beens, but only through coins do we know about their existence. So you know, coins should be used alongside texts and alongside archaeology um, for a full picture of antiquity. And uh, it, it's too bad that very often we neglect that. Well said. Um, I was in a discussion with Dr. Edward Watts mm -hmm. the other day, and uh, we were talking about not just the numismatic aspect, but inscriptions, things mm -hmm. like monuments. Yes. Uh, these are, and yeah, like you were saying, in a, in a, in a population that's majority illiterate, these mm -hmm. are functioning as divine text as well. Yes. These are projecting um, not just propaganda, but like the divine uh, ordainment and pr uh, provenance mm -hmm. of, of Rome's rule, right? So they should be taken in equal measure. And this is mm -hmm. something that's also being um, recognized increasingly in New Testament scholarship. Um, there was a, there's a scholar um, named Davina Lopez who uh, took Paul's letters and she intersected those with the iconography of things like the Sabastan mm -hmm. and um, these depictions of the barbarian other as subjugated females, you yes. know, and the sexual mm -hmm. violence in, in inherent in the Roman founding myths. Mm -hmm. And she said the same kind of thing, you know, we need more art historians and more people who focus on archaeology to intersect with history and New Testament studies to give a fuller picture because these are functioning just as much, these monuments and these coins are functioning just as much as uh, texts as the written mm -hmm. word itself. So yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, my own dissertation and my first book actually was just about that. You know, I, I talked about how uh, Roman governors, you know, their chief duty was trying cases, was being the most important judge in a given province. And so they would travel from city to city. It was called conventus. It was their assizes, pretty much. Uh, they were circuit judges. And so they would ride their circuit over the course of a year, going from city to city, spending a couple of weeks in each city, um, trying cases in the most important place in town, typically either in the forum, such agora, or in the basilica or by a temple beside it. And my entire project, my dissertation was about how these spaces in which they tried cases were part of the dialogue between the Roman imperial power and provincial elites. And that they were in many ways talking through these landscapes surrounding them, the statues, the inscriptions, um, the, the great colonnaded facades. You know, you, you can't say, you know, uh, you know, as an elite, you know, treat me fairly because that, that, that's implicit or it's pretty implicit in your dialogue. But the space can say that. Um, and when it comes to religion, of course, right, the, you know, the, the medium is the message, right, in a lot of ways. And that, that's true of a temple as well. There's a reason that they, it's so conservative, religious architecture, that they use the same kind of facades for millennium um, after, you know, there's all kinds of innovative ways to use concrete to do crazy interior spaces. Because, you know, that kind of facade connotes a millennium of tradition. You know, that's how the gods have to be addressed architecturally. Um, that's also, of course, why rituals are so conservative, because if it's worked once, well, why wouldn't it keep working? Um, and uh, yeah, it is fascinating. And, and I, I would love to see uh, much more cross-pollinization between archaeology and classical philology. Um, but, you know, it's it's not, uh, it's, it's hard to do well. And uh, the fact that I had to leave, that I left uh, academia speaks to how it's not terribly sellable either sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, no, no. So in other words, I have full agreement with everything you just said. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so I think my next question is a little bit, might be loaded, but um, let's go for it. Uh, this question sounds simple, but actually mu it's much more multifaceted than at first glance. So it's going to touch upon 
the myth concept and Greco-Roman society. Mm -hmm. um, so mythos and lore are an integral part, not just of the everyday life, but of paideia, um, intellectual elites like Cornutus paving the way for allegoresis. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition, the garbage etymology that they would do <laughs> um, that persists to this day. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, did the Greeks and Romans believe these myths? Yeah, well, that's it's a chapter in Naked Statues, um, and as I'm, I'm sure you know from looking at that, you know, there's obviously no single or simple answer to that. Um, you're right to say that the myths were always important to how the Greeks and the Romans saw themselves. Um, they, they could never jettison the myths until they became Christian, and even then they retained the myths um, as a sort of cultural knowledge. Um, you know, the, the question, of course, is whether, um, for the elite especially, if they had always been a sort of cultural knowledge only, or if this is part of how they understood the gods. Um, and of course, this changed over time. So in the beginning, from the, you know, the era of Homer, which is our first real window into um, the classical world, so this is the 8th century BC, um, you know, Homer and Hesiod, we, we assume that the myths are being taken, if not necessarily literally, seriously in this period, that, that this is part of how you know the gods. Uh, it's also very clear from the very beginning, though, that there's no single set of myths. Um, you know, Homer and Hesiod become the canon in a lot of ways. Their texts become part of Paideia, become part of education, and become, for Greek children, for the next thousand years and more, um, their first introduction to the gods, um, or at least, you know, their first systematic introduction to the gods. Um, but always there's this uncontrolled, incredibly diverse galaxy of local cults, um, each of which presents its own interpretation of the gods um, through practice, through cults, and through um, a dazzling array of local myths. And only those local myths that are taken up into um, the texts become iconic, become canonical. Whether those are taken more seriously than local cults by someone who lives in Thebes or in Sparta or in Athens, it's kind of hard for us to grasp because what we have um, are these very intellectualized texts. Um, often they're philosophical when I mean, they discuss the gods um, or they're historical. And so it's religion becomes tangential to them or at least becomes... Um, it's talked about in a very stylized way that divorces it from lived experience. And, and so, you know, we have, in other words, what the elite is saying to other members of the elite about the gods in these very particular contexts, these certain generic contexts. So if you're Plato, for example, you're talking about how the myths are harmful because they present the gods in a negative light, which tells us two interesting things, that Plato both believes in the gods uh, very seriously and that he thinks that's not crazy iconoclastic to say that you can disbelieve the myths, um, you know, and he's part of this or coming at the end of this uh, couple of generations of ferment in Athens, the sophists, you know, who call into question traditional religion and seem to, in some ways, um, leave a lasting legacy in Greek intellectual tradition, mainly through Plato and his answers to the sophists. Um, but I guess all, all we can say is that from the time of Plato, from the fifth century BC onward, um, for the Greek and Roman elite, it's okay and in some ways expected to disbelieve the myths, or at least to think that they are allegories, that they are not necessarily representations of the gods, you know, raping nymphs or doing other, you know, morally reprehensible things, that they are in some way, um, at best at least, um, a way of perceiving that god's sphere of influence and influence on moral affairs. And at worst, they should be just entirely, they're just, you know, ancient superstition, the gods exist, but they're nothing like their myths, and that's all there is to it. And so it seems that, again, for the elite, um, a lot depended on which philosophical tradition you subscribed to. Um, if you were a Stoic, you were much more likely to take the allegorical route, um, to do often write very slapdash allegories, you know, where, you know, a, a famous one, the, the god Ares sounds kind of like the Greek word for harm, so therefore, you know, <laughs> is the principle of harming, you know, philosophize for 10 pages thereafter. Um, it, it, it very much seems that, um, you know, the Stoics wanted to have a cake and eat it too, keep the myths, but also say, no, they're just allegories. Um, the Epicureans famously said that the gods, if they exist at all, um, are divorced from mankind, and the myths, therefore, have no meaning for us, save as stories. Um, Platonists, uh, you know, again, later on, the we, we tend to think of them kind of through the Neoplatonists, you know, the Imperial uh, Platonists. Um, who tended to uh, keep the myths, but allegorize the absolute hell out of them. And so they're, to the point they're almost unrecognizable. The gods become these higher demons who stand between mankind and the one supreme God. 
Um, and so in other words, for, for intellectuals, there's a, a dazzling array of approaches you can take to the bits where you both know them because you know them through the text you have to know as educated Greek or Roman. You have to know Homer, you have to know Virgil, and to know them is to know the gods. Um, but at the same time, they're not necessarily something you believe. For the vast majority of the population that's not writing philosophical texts, we really don't know. I mean, obviously people are going to the rituals, um, you know, they're, they're going through the practices through which mankind has addressed the gods for millennium. Does that mean they believe the myths as well? Um, you know, the elites tend to think so, we think, because like, oh, you know, the, the great unwashed, the multitude, of course they believe the myths, you know, they're slack-jawed yokels, why wouldn't they? Um, you know, we don't actually know uh, in most cases. You know, the fact that we have things like um, votive offerings, where you, you dedicate, um, you know, a small statuette or some other, uh, an altar base to a god. Um, yeah, they believed in the gods, it seems. Um, most people did, or we assume they did. But, you know, how much the myths were part of how they understood those gods. Um, you know, again, we, we throw up our hands <laughs> as historians, because all we have, you know, are the texts, which are opaque, um, the inscriptions, which tell us only this act was transacted between worshiper and God, and archaeology, which is susceptible to a huge range of interpretations. Um, so, yeah, probably. <laughs> that's right. what it comes down to. Yeah, we'll Across probably never the... really know. <laughs> no, and that's the thing, you know, that, that's, you know, what we have to often say as historians of antiquity is, okay, thus far, no further. Um, so we know individual answers to that question, but, you know, Right. You know, there's, you know, 100 million answers. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that I, uh, I've kind of come, um, come out of these interviews so far thinking is that we really need to read texts like Plutarch hand in hand with the technological Greek mm -hmm. magical papyri, because the Greek magical papyri really shows what people on the ground were doing. Mm -hmm when they're consulting these ritual specialists and mm -hmm. i mean we can't always pause it like you were saying whether they believe it or not but obviously they're interacting in, tra mm -hmm. in a transactional uh, transit uh transactional sense with these right. uh, deities and daimons um so fascinating thank you for that um cool. this is a con content creator on youtube mm -hmm. um is it sometimes uh you almost feel like sisyphus uh, <laughs> pushing the boulder up the up the hill eternally to to bring the academic content to the masses and it's just such an accessible but also scholarly way that you do um, especially mm -hmm. what you do which I find very um, admirable that you do it in six to ten minute video segments which is you know mm -hmm. like people don't realize how hard it is to succinctly uh, digest this stuff into palatable um, kind of bits for people to understand and also do it in an entertaining way, which you do very well. Um, so I want to commend you for that. Um, so I think as a content creator, you're dealing with, for lack of a better term, conspiracy theories, right? <laughs> Especially on YouTube and TikTok, you have everything from the Roman Empire never <laughs> existed to, you know, Jesus never existed. So mm -hmm. um, I just thought, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experiences as a content creator and um, if you have some crazy encounters that you've experienced mm -hmm. in your journey so far. Oh, yes. Um, well, let's lead off with the first question. Um, yes, Sisyphean is an apt adjective sometimes uh, because it's not so much that the writing is quick enough. Um, you know, that's something you kind of get into the habit of is writing these, these kind of succinct scripts. And the visuals, you know, I work with a video editor now um, who takes a lot of that part off my back, which is great. Um, the hard part is the research, you know, do, doing, you know, good academic research um, every week, you know, quickly. And uh, it, it can be exhausting when especially I'm doing something else, which I almost always, almost always am. You know, I'm writing a book. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in Europe doing, you know, some kind of travel thing for YouTube. And when you're not treating it like the full-time job that it is, um, it can quickly pile up and just bury you. Um, and so, yeah, like anybody, I think, like most content creators, you kind of live in this love-hate relationship with your medium um, where, you know, YouTube makes so many things possible for me. Um, it makes, makes me, allows me to do what I love outside of academia, which I would not be able to otherwise because you know, people don't buy enough books, frankly. Um, but at the same time, um, the nature of the medium, right, exposes, makes you present that material in what feels like, uh, you know, kind of a slapdash way. It feels minimalist. It feels uh, irresponsible sometimes. And you're dealing with, right, these 
absurd conspiracy theories sometimes. My, 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 my favorite one um, is the, the mud flood. I don't know if you've encountered this before. It's the idea that somehow, for reasons completely unknown to the people who subscribe to this too, um, about a century ago, the world was submerged by a biblical style flood that covered everything in, you know, like 30 feet of, well, mud. Um, and that uh, that is the greatest continuity in history. And so everything you think is in history is actually a lie. It's much more recent. I don't know where this comes from, but I did a, a video once about how why Rome is buried, you know, how it was buried by its own debris, essentially. And uh, a lot of mud flutters came up in the comments. Um, I also got an email from somebody who was absolutely convinced um, that Jesus was crucified in the Colosseum. Don't know how they came to that particular conclusion, but uh, it wasn't built yet, for one thing, when that happened. Uh, but uh, yeah, that they, they, they sent some very long emails to me on that subject, to which you know I pointedly did not reply, but oh well. Um, someone helped me find a lost mine at one point. That was fun. Um, so you, you end up with, yeah, yeah being a public facing historian um, can be a wonderful thing. Uh, but, but sometimes, right, you know, the, the public you're facing is a public you're not expecting. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. Um, unfortunately, it seems like it's easier to be Graham Hancock these days than to be yeah, Garrett Ryan. Yeah, that, that guy. Um, both in terms of views and in terms of, I guess, monetary rewards. Um, yeah. But that's another subject. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> um, so as you mentioned before, um, you are working on a, a new book. Um, is it a sequel to Naked Statues or is it something different? I didn't know if you could tell us anything about it mm -hmm. at this stage. Sure. Yeah, no, I'll be doing the grand announcement in probably about a month and a half when the page proofs are done. I can, you know, present to me a more full picture of the book. But yeah, I'm done with it now. I finished writing about a month ago. I uh, finished proofing uh, everything about two weeks ago. It is a sequel to Naked Statues um, called, the Naked, in the same vein as Naked Statues, um, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines. And before you ask, earthquake, the Earthquake Machine was an early steam engine that I'm talking about. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's the same deal. It, it answers 40 questions about the Greeks and the Romans um, in that short kind of pithy style that I tried to use in Naked Statues. Um, many of the answers this time uh, began actually from something I was doing for YouTube. And they're kind of extended versions of a video script where it's like the real answer, you know, in depth with the footnotes and everything. Um, and uh, it, uh, it almost killed me, frankly, to finish the book while I was doing all my YouTube stuff because I had to essentially conjure it up from nothing in the course of about two months, which was a lot. Um, but uh, it's done now. It will be out in the world October 1st. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see it, you know, finally approaching the light. Uh, you know, it, it really is. Um, yeah, if you enjoy the good statues, you'll enjoy this book too. Or I sure hope so. Um, and uh, it, it's been, it's always a pleasure, you know, for, for me writing scripts for YouTube. Um, you know, I really see myself as an author first and foremost. And, you know, I, when you're writing a script for YouTube, you know that what your script takes the backseat to the visuals. You know, it's a visual medium. It's the nature of the beast. You know, so be it. Um, so it, it's nice writing a book because you know that the prose, you know, takes the front seat. And then, you know, you, they, whatever, you know, little small merits I might have as an author will be appreciated for what they, you know, for what they are. And, and so, um, yeah, and I, I enjoyed the process despite, you know, the exhaustion <laughs> of writing the book. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to announcing its launch on Told in Stone uh, in about a month and a half. Yeah, so very much looking forward to that. Love Naked Statues. Um, and I definitely want to hear about this earthquake machine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Um, so Garrett, um, I think this is going to be a super complicated question, so feel free to skip it if you need, but um, I think it's the most important. Um, why didn't Romans use their aqueducts as water slides? <laughs> you know, I feel like the empire would never have fallen if they had decided, discovered that last key, you know, key component, you know, to classical civilization. Um one of my favorite videos ever, of course, was on this very topic. Um, and it was, I was asked on Reddit, actually, initially. I, I used to be very active on Ask Historians on Reddit. And someone asked this question, and I loved they asked this question. And so I just went full bore on it. Um, the short answer is um, that there was usually no gradient in aqueducts, um, you know, a, very, a very slight gradient. You know, so if you're building an aqueduct, you know, your goal is to economize a material. And so you, you want to keep your source um, 
as low as possible. So you have only have to go, um, so you're not building a giant, you know, sprawling uh, arcades, you know, across your whole length. Or if you do have a lot of gradient, you want to bring it down right away and then have it decline very, go very slowly uh, going towards the city. Also, there's too much gradient. Um, it'll, the water will erode the channel on the inside, the mortar on the inside. So you'll have you know, water coming out you know, from the side of the aqueduct. Um, so most of our aqueducts only go down a foot or two every mile. So you really can't slide very well. You get in, maybe do like a slip and slide deal, but you know, it wouldn't be very satisfying. There were, however, I discovered, um, some things called aqueduct cascades. So when there was a spring located, say, high up on a slope, and they wanted to bring it down to the level of the plane and have that channel going out towards the city, they would bring it down very rapidly through a series of often open slide-like channels with water coming down. So there you could have slid, um, but if you had slid, you would have gone into this dark channel that was never accessed and probably would have died down there. Um, often they, they weren't very deep. Typically you're talking about a, a foot at most of water um, with off, kind of a slow flow. Um, you know, they were cleaned out pretty routinely, so they weren't too slippery either. Um, and of course they're dark, you know, you, the, the channel is normally, um, about wide and tall enough, um, for a man to walk down for the maintenance people to scrape out, you know, in, in crustaceans and stuff. So you could do it theoretically, but it wouldn't be very comfortable. You're scraping the walls on both sides. Um, and of course, ultimately they didn't do it because it's their water supply. They don't want people, you know, <laughs> playing, playing around in their drinking water. Um, Nero famously took a bath in one of Rome's main springs and was, uh, there was an outbreak of disease right afterward. People blamed it on Nero taking a bath in the springs, you know, where they had the aqueducts coming down from. Um, so long and short of it is they could have done it in the Cascades at least. Um, but, you know, alas, we have no record of it being done. Yeah, it seems like a missed opportunity. I can really see it does, it does. like Commodus or Julian really mm -hmm. putting on their floaties and stuff. And right, right. Getting down with those. Um, <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we should learn from their mistakes and uh, invest you know, in them. I, and actually, that there is, um, I discovered in Florida, a resort that uh, tried to recreate parts of Pompeii and then have a water slide go down through it. And I tried hard to get them to sponsor my aqueduct water slide video. I thought it'd be a great, you know, little thing. And if you want to really experience a water slide, but alas, they, they weren't cool. That would have been the most epic thing ever. And yeah, that is, that's one of my favorite videos of yours, too. There, you have so many great videos. Um, and I just want to thank you again for all your hard work and bringing these um, stories and, you know, the people who live them to life. It, it really is a service to, you know, interested lay people like myself who otherwise, even when I was in college, I didn't hear about a lot of these things unless I did independent mm -hmm. study. Sure. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you again for that. Um, so, Garrett, you have obviously told in stone, you have told in stone footnotes, your podcast. Mm -hmm. um, just feel free to take this time to plug whatever, uh, where can people find you? Um, you know, the floor oh, sure. is yours. Oh, well, well, thank you. Um, and let me say that it has been a pleasure to talk to you as well, you know, because the, the really the, the best thing about being a, a content creator on the internet is that you get to meet, you know, virtually at least thousands of people um, who love the same things you do. And that's you know, the most rewarding part of what I do on Told in Stone. Um, so yeah, so I have, I have my, my YouTube channel, Told in Stone. Um, I have actually two other YouTube channels as well. Um, one, Told in Stone Footnotes for the podcast and other uh, live stuff. Um, one called Cine Roots of the Past, which is for my travel content. Um, but of course, the, the, the my baby, the thing that I'm most keen to publicize is the upcoming book, um, which is titled um, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines published on October 1st, available for pre-order now. And if you go to my website, uh, tonestone.com, you'll see a link to buy it there, or it's on Amazon as well. But uh, that's the thing, of course, that as an author, I love that people read that book. So I think if you love antiquity, there's a lot of stuff that you'll find uh, fascinating there. I sure hope so. Garrett, this has been an absolute pleasure and honor. Thank you very much. We hope to speak to you again soon, and best of luck. I appreciate it, Jason. Have a great time. Yeah.